Good morning, students. Today we are going to discuss a highly significant story from Hanikum, the CBSE textbook for class seven. The story that we are going to discuss today is titled Quality. I say story, but make no mistake, this is so much more than just a story. This story is an ode to those artisans who, in the face of a world driven by money and immediate gratification, dare to stay true to their crafts. It is an ode to those who do not go gentle into that good night, here represented by the Gessler brothers. However, before we begin, let's first learn a little bit more about the writer John Goldsworthy. John Goldsworthy was born on 14th August 1867 in Kingston Hill, England, and he died on 31st January 1933 at the age of 65 in Hampstead, England. His notable works include the Foresight Saga, To Let, Justice, a wonderful drama, The White Monkey, Strife. He was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1932 for his contribution to literature, and this particular text, Quality, is taken from The Inn of Tranquility, Studies and Essays, first published in 1912. Now, before we move on, let's have a pictographic depiction of the artist sitting with his art. In the story, it is highlighted that success is determined by advertisement and not by work. And here we have the artist. This story shows us what happens to the artist and his art and the man when faced with cutthroat and unfair competition in the world. Now, let's talk about the themes for a bit. As for themes, we have arts for art's sake quality versus quantity and finally the story shows us that dedication can make every work a piece of art. Now before we move further, let's stop here for a moment and think why should we read the story? What is the relevance of the story even today? So let's straight get to the business. You see in this dog its dog world, it has been seen more often than not that the big companies and corporate sectors with Advertisements, brand names, huge output at their arsenal engulf the small businesses. Cottage industry is often just killed. Just think about it. In this world of Flipkart and Amazon premium delivery, how often do you have actually go out to buy, say for example, books or electronics? And in these days of COVID-19 pandemic, we are ordering even more from home. These days, even fresh vegetables and dairy products are being delivered by these corporate organizations. But when we are gradually becoming couch potatoes, ordering away gleefully through the smart gadget on our palms, what happens to those small businesses who just can't keep up with the cutthroat corporate competition and neither can sacrifice the quality of their work? Because for them, their work is not just work, it is their source of livelihood their art and worship. Let's read the story about one such man and see what fate awaits him till the very end. So first of all, who are the characters in this story? For characters, we have the narrator himself, the Gessler brothers and an Englishman, though his role is very little. So we will concern ourselves with the narrator and the Gessler brothers. Now. Every story has a conflict. In fact, it is a conflict that makes a story interesting. You see, in literature, conflict signifies a struggle between two opposing forces. It is that element that makes a story really interesting. In quality, the conflict is both internal and external in nature. Externally, the conflict is between a shoemaker and the big industries. This conflict is uneven to say the least and it ends with Mr. Gessler starving and dying. Him losing the long drawn uneven fight. However, the internal conflict is not so simple. This is a conflict between an artist and a dealer. The big firms may destroy a man's body, destroy his business even, but it can never destroy the artist in him. Gessler died a defeated man, but the artist in him won the final battle. 
Gessler never compromised with his art. In his lifetime, he never let it become just a business. And in his death, he immortalized his art. So, let's now talk about the summary of the text. It's a very simple text on the surface, but the points that it tries to make, it, it, it tries to bring to the foreground, they are really very important. So, without further ado, let's move on. The summary. You see, there was a small shop in a small by street of London. The shop was simple with not much on display and only the name Gessler Brothers. The shoemakers made only such shoes as were ordered. Gessler was a master shoemaker. His shoes were a perfect feat and lasted very long. He used the best quality leather for his work. Because of the long-lasting nature of his shoes, customers couldn't return to him as often as would support his business. And you see, this was his only fault. He made his work perfect, but the cost of the perfection was the loss of his business. Over the years, his business started to suffer. The uneven competition with the big firms finally defeated him. The firms, the companies, the industries, they were making shoes you know, using uh, machines. But Gessler was making shoes using his own hands. They were all handmade. So naturally, he was falling behind. Also, the shoes made by these companies were cheaper, mass-produced as they were. And Gessler, his shoes were costly. So he was finally defeated. However, the last time the narrator visits Gessler brothers, he learns that the poor shoemaker has starved himself to death, but never sacrificed with his art. So now, let's take a look at the setting of this story. The story is basically set in London and it talks about a certain shop, Gessler brothers there. It is a shoe store run by two German brothers. And now we come to the important part, the basic, most important points to discuss in this story. First of all, the first thing that we note is the shop, Gessler Brothers. The shop in the story is not just any shop. It assumes a life of its own, some quality that separates it from the other shops of its kind. First of all, the shop didn't depend on glitzy advertisements. The shoes on display too were not many. It's a shop which caters to a select group of customers making shoes as per the order. Even the feeling inside was different. Rather than a place of business, it seemed like a holy place. A church because of the devotion of the artist to his art. There was no hurry inside. People would come, they would sit in a single chair and wait for the master shoemaker to arrive, to descend from some other corner, some other floor inside the shop. And he will wait smelling the fragrance of fine leather. And then the man would come inside, instead of selecting shoes from the display, the customer would mention the kind of shoes he wants to the master shoemaker. He will come back again with a piece of leather, take appropriate measurements, Select the leather quality and the shoes would be made as per his choice. So this shop, as you can understand, is completely different from the other shops that we find today. Next comes the person, the artist himself, Mr. Gessler, the artist. Mr. Gessler was not like any other shoemaker. He considered his work an art and he was its master artist. Gessler believed in quality over quantity. Made with honesty, love and devotion, his shoes lasted much longer than usual. Competition with the big firms broke his body but not his spirit. Near the end, he aged terribly. His face showed every sign of the bitter struggle and the hardships. After a point of time, he even failed to recognize the narrator. His long time 
loyal customer. The one thing that never left him was his love for his art. He starved himself, worked in the cold without fire, only to use all his money to get the best leather and his energy to produce the best shoes. He may have been a shoemaker, but in his art, he was in the same league as Picasso or Van Gogh. And he sacrificed his life for his art. You see, art triumphs over everything. Now, we come to the big firms. A commentary on the big firms. But even before that, let's just take a moment to consider this final point. The art. Art for art's sake. You see, some people, like these big firms, they produce things to sell and earn money. And there are some, like Mr. Gessler, who doesn't so much produce as they create. Their work being an art and seldom they make monetary gain their primary objective. Such people believe in quality art rather than quantity product. Gisler was one such person. The narrator mentions his dream of boots to indicate how he lived not in the mundane world of harsh reality but in a dream world of his art. His pride for his art didn't allow him to change with time. He didn't advertise, didn't try to cater for the mass. He only poured all the love of his heart in every pair of shoes he made with his own hand. Just as the flame burns bright just before it is extinguished, Gessler produced his best work as he approached death. Death took away the man, but the artist remained immortal in his art. The narrator's comment, he made good boots, is a validation of the immortality of the art and its sole artist. Now, the master shoemaker, Gessler, was destroyed by the big firms. The first time this becomes apparent when the narrator comes in the shop wearing shoes bought at some large firm. Remember those small uh, stationery shops or the grocery store in your neighborhood where you went in your childhood to buy things? But now think about it. Today you are ordering even Horlicks or Compton or any kind of food item, any kind of gourmet food product, noodles, Maggie, whatever you want from online. You are placing your order on Amazon. You are availing discounts. Or maybe if you are going to the market, you are going to the big bazaar and such other supermarkets. Wednesday sale, this sale, that sale to avail all those offers, coupons. They are taking, you know, these big houses, these supermarkets, these uh, uh, companies, they are taking the customers from those small grocery stores away. Now think about it. The grocery store in your locality, in your neighborhood, thrived on what they sold to you. Today, what are they selling? Who are buying? Maybe the past generation, the old generation, they are still going to them. But what about the new customers? What about you? What about me? Where are we buying our products? We are the victim of this consumerism. These companies, they understand what we need and they make the advertisement. You know, this there is a huge research work that goes behind these advertisements. They assess their valued customers, our psychology, what we want, what we dream of. And then they make the advertisements which cater to all our dreams, hopes, desires. And then we go and buy all those products, all those big brand names. We give our money to them instead of those people from whom we used to buy those, you know, those cola or those small, uh, you know, candies in our childhood. We don't buy any more from them. So these buildings, 
these you know amazon these uh, these supermarkets they are destroying this flipkart these shopping malls you go to any big city you will come across shopping malls one building in which there are so many shops so many brands available you go there you buy your things from them but you don't buy from your own locality your own neighborhood it is only a rare case only in case of emergency this happens this is happening you see similarly this man this narrator he used to buy his shoes from gesler brothers his father actually took him there in his childhood but one day when he came to the shop he was wearing shoes which he had bought from somewhere else now this is the point i was trying to be even maybe by mistake maybe he didn't even think this much when he bought the shoes but the fact is he had moved away knowingly or unknowingly now gesler is not a griffon he was neither sad as an artist he was above those emotions which had their source in a competitive mindset he didn't have a competitive mindset you see because otherwise he would have advertised his work he was a master shoe maker and if he advertised the longevity of his shoes he may have got some new customers but he never did that he loved what he did it was his art and he never tried to sell his art so in a matter of fact manner he explained how those big firms are ruining small businesses like his the firms unlike such shoe makers as gesler cares nothing you know for the quality and thrive on the quantity of the shoes they produce for the mass market they know nothing about art all they can do is to advertise their cheap products they reduce the quality of the work to get it and to offer it at a cheaper price and thus lure away the customers from shoe makers like gesler who love not money but the art of making it the way gesler mentioned that he had no work froze the blood of the narrator he realized how the big firms are going to kill gesler he was ashamed to have come in the shop of an artist wearing cheap imitations and in his guilt by looking at the signs of hardship on gesler's face ordered many pairs of shoes in an effort to help him let's now come to the final part you see after this part after this commentary on the big farms nothing left to be said one man the narrator he was on a guilt trip and he bought so many new pairs from gesler but just think about it one man the narrator his orders alone cannot save a person he cannot maintain his shop his living daily livelihood he cannot do that the other customers had already moved away and it was only a matter of time when the shop was going to be closed at least the shop of gesler was going to be closed and as we reach the end of the story this happens the shop changes hand but not before gesler dies and even with his dying breath just as he was supposed to do we cannot imagine any other kind of death for him he was working on his latest art you know this story this this a uh, fate of the artist reminds me of another story this story about a painter who had this dream of making one masterpiece in his life but what happened he was a failed artist but finally to save the life of a young girl she was actually sick and she thought that when the final leaf the last leaf of a tree that she could see from her window would fall she too will die this man goes out alone in the dark night in a stormy night and makes one leaf so vivid and attaches it on the tree now this artificial leaf saved the life of the girl but in the process he gave up his own life he was struck with influenza and he died 
The story is by O. Henry and the title is The Last Leaf. It is a very famous story. But as you can see, a true artist would much prefer die working on his art, creating than anything else. And that's what happens with Gessler. His art, the moment, all the time that he spent with his work, with his art, made him happy, made him forget all about the mundane reality. He was a big bird, an albatross flying high in the sky. This mundane reality of everyday world, that was not for him. He was clumsy there. He could not advertise. He didn't know the market trends. He didn't know how to, you know, how to survive. All he knew was how to maintain the quality. So this story revolves around Gessler and his art. The narrator knew Gessler from a very young age. Even his father went to them for his shoes. The Gessler never compromised with quality. Their work was worship for them. If shoemaking was an art, then with the skill, devotion and pride in their work, the Gesslers were the artists. Even when the competition with the big firms grew tougher, the Gesslers didn't compromise with the quality of their product. The master shoemaker gave up his life to make the perfect pair of shoes. He starved himself to death so that no one can question the quality of his art. This story is the story of an artist and the extent he was devoted to the quality of his art. Therefore, quality as the title of this story is perfect. And with this we come to an end of our discussion. I hope you have understood the chapter and enjoyed it quite well. I would suggest that you go back, read the chapter properly and then again come back to this. This is really a wonderful story and even after listening to it and reading the story, if you still have any question, ask us anytime and we will surely get back to you. Till then, bye bye.